So what's going on? Uh, just doing a bunch of stuff for the record release. We have a, a few radio shows this week and next week. So we've been rehearsing and getting ready. And I've been like ma- signing and, and mailing things out. You know how it goes. It's like, <laughs> how is <laughs> that? Came out on Friday. <laughs> how is that having to repeat the signature over and over and over again and many different things? It's good. I'm really, really uh, well versed at the thing at this point. So <laughs> it's like a, uh, it's harder, I think, when you're in person and doing it and and trying to write, you know, some message to folks. But just the signing that's that's pretty pretty easy. Mm-hmm. So what do you um the album's out on the well it's already out right on the 23rd it was yeah released? it came it came out on Friday the 23rd so this past Friday we were in Vegas at the iHeart Radio Music Festival doing music press and watching shows and things and um then I'm just back in Portland as of yesterday and uh, doing it here now we we head out to the Midwest and uh, this press sort of a press tour I have the the record and then. Um, I'm on a TV show this fall or winter rather. Um, so I've been doing a little bit of stuff for that as well. So it's, it's a busy time, but, <laughs> but a good, it's a good time. Wow. That's crazy. What's the, what's the name of the TV show? TV show is called, um, last meal. Mm-hmm. And right now it's a, a sort of a web series concept, but it's like me and, um, Hutch Harris from the thermals and, um, a, a bunch of other people. Uh, sort of Portland uh, musicians. The the concept of it, it's, it's made by Two Penguins Productions. Which they do a bunch of stuff for GQ. Mm-hmm. And, um, the concept is that these restaurateurs, the Grimmers, who are actual restaurant owners in town um, here in Portland, have their favorite bands over, and and it's like a, a B sort of horror movie. And at the end, so like they interview the band or the artist, and then at the end, they kill them in some fantastic, violent way. <laughs> um, and so the idea is that they're serving you your last meal. So I, I, I was on episode six of that. I'm doing a little bit of promotion for that. That'll amp up here in a little while mm-hmm. once they make the announcement. But it's, a, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. Mm-hmm. And I, um, you know, right now I'm focused on the record. The record is um, fresh out. And obviously that's, you know, it's my baby. So Yeah, that's... Uh, now, did you ever think... Like when you were younger, or starting music that you'd ever do a TV show and you know be featured on MTV and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, I think I had hoped for that mm-hmm. when I was young. You know, I grew up in the Midwest in a super small town, and um, I, you know, I think part of how I survived that experience of just being um, in a place that that felt like you know I wasn't, I, I, sh- I didn't belong there. You know, was. Um, to watch Kids Incorporated on the Disney Channel and like pretend I was like somewhere else. I had like a association thing uh, specific to TV and um, that helped me get through in the early days. I watched a, a lot of MTV. I wasn't allowed to, but I would go in the basement and watch it um, when we had babysitters and things like that. So, um, you know, it's always been a part of my life. I I don't think... Um, that I could have anticipated the logo TV thing happening. Like when MTV came out with logo mm-hmm. and suddenly they, they came to me and were like, um, wanting me to be on the channel. I was one of the primary, um, original artists on that video show. And then I, I hosted that show and it, uh, called new now next on logo. And it felt to me at the time, I remember thinking like, huh, this thing I've always felt was like, you know, the reason I was getting beaten up um, is now suddenly why people are coming and, and wanting me to be on their their network. <laughs> so, um, you know, life is funny like that. Yeah. So sometimes the stuff that you think is your um, your weakness or, or like, you know, your plight in the world actually ends up being a gift. Yeah. Now, do you feel that listening to music and do you felt that that got you through uh, parts of your childhood and just everyday life when Absolutely. things get hard, you use music for that? Yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, I, I experienced a lot of abuse growing up and, and I feel like, you know, music was my way of, of taking myself somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also, you know, it was always like this thing I knew I could do, right? Like I knew I could sing and, and from an early age, I was writing songs. I mean, I got signed for the first time when I was 17. So um, I felt like really protective of it and and throughout the years as as life would fall apart the one thing i was kind of able to maintain is this music bug and, and the you know i always 
it was always my way of getting out the, the toxic stress of life. Like I always wrote songs and I always wrote lyrics and, and that was kind of how I kept it's part of my self care plan or something, kept myself sane that way. Mm. So um even in times where I've like quit music or, or done some kind of dramatic thing like that, I still make it, you know, I'm still writing. Yeah, man. I mean, th- that's the one thing, you know, if that's the reason why I listen to music and why I, why I play music, um, you know, because it gets you through the hard times. And that's why I feel like music's always going to be around, you know, it's yeah, really like with, with, with sports and stuff like that, you know, that might that might get you through tough times, too. But I just feel like people underappreciate music for, you know, it's just some something that like you don't think of in the back. Of your, well, at least when you're not a musician, you, you don't yeah. think of you know in that yeah, way you take it for granted for yeah. sure it's at the very least been you know undervalued or completely devalued right mm-hmm. yeah so it's like as a, even as an art form it's one of the only ones where you're expected to create something and have it be free then you know it's like an interesting thing i think that it's it's medicinal on some level though for you know for me and other musicians i know i think it's, it's the sort of the lifeline mm-hmm. So let's uh let's get back into the uh the studio album. So it's your eighth one. Uh yeah. so is that is that crazy to think that you've, you know, it's like you came so far and that you've had eight studio albums under your belt. It must feel like, you know, for me I have been at my job for 8 years and it almost feels right. like it took forever. Do you do you kind of compare it in the same yeah. way like Yeah, it's an interesting thing, you know, cuz I st- it's um you know, I've been doing it a long time and I've had a lot of opportunities and then I've accomplished a lot and also I think there's still a lot of people who haven't heard of me and so like it's an interesting space to occupy right like this new artist space for for two decades <laughs> it's quite the thing um and also you know I feel really lucky that I still get to make music I still have an audience I think it's cool that new um new people are still discovering me and my change I changed my sound a little bit a few years ago this is the first record that's really um representative of that in that i you know i used to be a dj and make techno sort of electro pop music um and now i play we play instruments and you know i work with one songwriter instead of 10 producers and so the process has really changed and i think that has re sort of reignited something in me around my initial love for music you know some of some of what the record sounds like is 90s and some of it's theatrical and, and some of it's very um, you know, soft mm-hmm. and and not super covered up with blaring synths and things like that. And so in some way it feels really dangerous. Mm-hmm. And also I, I think it's the most like me, this record, but, than any of the stuff I've ever put out. Mm-hmm. And I tend to I tend to think that um historically, but but not to not in such a pure way. I think mm-hmm. there's a this is the record I've been trying to make for eighteen years. So, so that was the reason for your switch that you you've been dreaming or kind of pushing towards an album in you know this kind of style, and that was the reason for the way the album came out was just because this is what you've wanted to do all along, and you know you finally did it. I think so. Yeah. Well, and I've you know I I don't know how it happened the other way around, but um, you know I this is the first time where a hundred percent of the songs started with me. Mm-hmm. You know, they started as a cappella sort of spirituals on my phone or or in a in the studio and then Gino built out the music from there and so before you know if somebody comes with something that they've made and I, and I would write lyrics and melodies around it that's that's totally different you know this was yeah. this was very much my mind all the way through and and Gino kind of went and uh, he's my co-writer producer guy Gino Mari mm-hmm. he went through and um you know he listened to like a hundred different records that I had put together for him to listen to that that had sort of changed my life and altered my path as I was a young person uh, and, you know, records that has either saved my life or, or I felt had really inspired me. So he spent months with those albums and those artists before he went in and started writing it. And so it really does sound like all of the music that I love, you know, it sounds like me, but it's like a hybrid or it's an homage to, everything I've ever listened to on some level. It's, mm-hmm. it's, um, that, that also is very different. You know, it's about music I love. Um, and it's a, about a message that is really, um, raw on top of that. 
Now, did he come to you? Is that why? Did he come to you with an idea of, hey, listen, why don't you get a bunch of these records that you know really shaped you and and put them together and let's see if we can make something from that? Is that is that kind of like what happened? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I had come to him with the acapella demos, mm-hmm. uh, the whole record in acapella demo form. And he was like, oh my God, right, let's make this record. And I think the process that he felt would be the truest to um, me. Like if I were the kind of guy that could do it all myself, mm-hmm. what would it sound like? What would it sound like to pay homage to the Dandy Warhols and Liz Fair and um, my mentors, Elliot Smith and you know my friends, the Chromatics and all these bands that like, had been really influential in either my life or in my style. Um, he really took the time to uh, get to know them so that he could also be influenced by them. You know, I mean, it's an interesting thing to try to have someone else work on the music without the experience of, of you know, the music that I love. So um, he, he's the first producer in 18 years to take the time to figure that out. That's crazy. So yeah. it's funny that before you know going back to what you said before where you know people would bring you stuff and you'd write your vocals and 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 things around it. I kind of you know it's funny to say but I kind of feel like that's what normal like a lot of bands that I listen to what they do I mean they don't get random people or producers or you know other people to bring music and then they produce it. They have like a guitar player that comes to them with a riff. So it's right. kind of cool to hear that, you know, even in different music, it kind of works the same way, you know, organically that, that when someone brings it, then you write it over it. It's like, well, that happens in rock and, and metal and stuff too. The guitar player writes its, their own, you know, music and then boom, this, you know, the singer in that band comes up with something else. Right. Yeah. It's, it was a totally different process, I think, for him too. You know, it's not, it's not the usual way that we've worked, mm-hmm. um, but it did, it did sure work out. Yeah. So now uh, let's get back to the the Dandy Warhols. They're, they're uh, definitely, yeah. you know, from looking all over, it, it definitely seems like they're a huge influence on you. So how would you yeah. say that they shaped, you know, your music? And like what em- elements of your music did they shape? Like does it help shape the lyrics, sure. the sound, over the, the overall tone? Like what, what does their, their influence do for your music? Well, I think, you know, I mean, they were my mentors. So when I was really young, I befriended them here in the Portland music scene right when they were taking off. Then they blew up huge famous and, and are, you know, really successful in their own right. Sort of at the end of the 90s, they were like one of the last of the dinosaur bands. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so they took me under their wing and, and managed my career and signed me to their label, um, you know, all throughout the 2000, early 2000s. Um, I was basically managed by them for the greater part of a decade. And, um, you know, on on this record, we did um, these specific throwbacks to them as far as their sound. But I think the way that they influenced me was really more about, you know, access and, and um, early on telling people to listen to me and then helping to shape my career as far as, you know, who I, what that voice was, like, who am I trying to be? It was, they they were very um, early adopters for me. I wasn't nearly as um, established as a, as an artist or as a writer or anything like that when they decided to invest in me. And I just wouldn't be where I am without them. So when we were writing um, songs, I wanted to pay homage to them and to other bands who had really helped me in real life or in my mind <laughs> you know one of the, either either of those like one I of those yeah be, yeah i mean because both matter right like both matter it mattered when i was a 10 year old listening to um amy grant in headphones it mattered when i was a 15 year old listening to liz fair in headphones and it mattered when i was 21 and being mentored in real life by um elliot smith and the dandy warhols and folks you know i feel like all of those things you know, I'm the sum of all of those parts, basically. Yeah. Now, what um, what other styles of music that are? Do you listen to anything that are that's kind of you know far off from what you you do in your music? Like, do you listen to any country? Do you listen to any like hard rock? Like, what other styles would you say don't fit what your influences are? Yeah, I listen to a lot of top forty radio, mm-hmm. a lot like a lot of pop music um and i think that used to fit in more than it does now and there's certainly elements of that still in my music but um you know it's it's 
you know, the iHeartRadio Music Festival, we were, we were just out. I saw like 16 shows because I legitimately wanted to see those bands <laughs> or, or, you know, whatever the karaoke act was that they were doing. Like I was super into it. Um, and so I think I, you know, I'm, I'm sort of in this underground indie scene here in Portland and have been for forever. Mm. Um, but, but I really appreciate pop culture and I'm, I'm part of that. You know, my, Miley Cyrus, um, performed our version of her song mm. on a bunch of different shows and her label released our, um, our, our cover of We Can't Stop a few years back. Wow, and I that's felt awesome. like, yeah, it was super awesome. And it was like one of the only times where we had really touched like mainstream culture. Mm-hmm. Um, and I felt like, you know, it's not really that far off. Like I had it in my head. I was like, oh man, this is, you know, I appreciate that world, but we're not really part of it. And mm-hmm. it's actually not true. You know, it's like we're all kind of in the same pool. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just a, it's a pendulum of like spotlight, right? And mm-hmm. sometimes it swings your way. And, and for the most part, it doesn't. Um, but it was, you know, that was a really cool thing. Um, and that would never have happened if I didn't listen to top 40 radio and didn't pick up on like the sadness underneath that we can't stop song and, Mm -hmm. and, you know, written, written something with Gino to pull that sadness out. All of that, um, you know, my interpretation of pop top 40 music, um, is, is also an influence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm a rocker, you know, I listen to metal, I listen to hard rock. You know, and, yeah. and then in one sense, you know, the music I listen to isn't really quote unquote like indie or alternative. I listen to like you're the equivalent of a top 40 band for rock and metal. And and sure. also, and also for, you know, I mean, the bands I listen to, they're not I didn't find them if they weren't, you know, I wouldn't have found them if they weren't popular, basically. And, uh, right. and another thing, too, is, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say I didn't listen to top 40 music when I was a kid because you know, when I was a kid, it was K Rock, which you know they they had some on there, but and it was Z one hundred, Z one hundred. They mixed yep. Top Forty, and then they mixed bands like Breaking Benjamin. I remember hearing them on the radio, and now yeah. it's <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and I remember I had a Shania Twain CD. Uh, you know, me personally, I wouldn't want to admit <laughs> yeah. that, but for me as a kid, you know, it's something I got into, and then obviously totally, now man. I'm not, and so I'm not going to sit here and say that I don't like it. <laughs> Well, I mean, a hook's a hook, right? Yeah, exactly. I, I, I can find I can find something that I like in a lot of different things. Country's a little bit of a hard sell, just having grown up in the, you know, in a town of five thousand people in rural Nebraska. Mm-hmm. But um, I, I absolutely appreciate anybody who makes good music. You know, I, even if it's not my thing, there's something, um, there's a kinship there that I feel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there's a, you know, I I'd say there's a lot of songs that when I first hear it, I, I might not like the music. But you hear that hook and it instantly it catches you, you know. That's why totally. when you're, you know, if there's a song you think you hate and you have it stuck in your head, there's a reason for that. It's it's catchy and the the hook got you. Yeah, absolutely, man, absolutely. <laughs> Another thing, uh, you know, that I noticed the album, you know, was actually reviewed by Jay Moore. I mean, I've never, yeah, I've never, you know, when I hear that name, I'm like, okay, who was that? You know, instantly when I Google and see his image, I'm like. That that's crazy to to think that a high profile <laughs> actor like that that you know everyone would know from Jerry Maguire reviewed your album. Yeah. How, how, what do you think about that? And he gave you a glowing review as well. He did. Yeah, it was really I mean, that part was wild. The Dandies wrote a great review. Sheila Hamilton, who's like a, a rock DJ here in Portland, wrote mm-hmm. one. Sher- Lynn Cheryl Strayed like shared our our record out with her people. It's it, it is really wild. Um, for me to have people like that know, you know, know who I am, much less like <laughs> take the time to write about their experience as something I created. It's super weird and mm-hmm. awesome. Um, you know, and that's, that's a new thing that certainly hasn't happened, um, previously as much as it is happening now. And so, um, I guess, you know, I, I take that as a good sign for the record. I also think, Um, you know, the people who are, um, writing about it or who seem to be discovering it are also people who have built their careers, um, if not always in recent years, um, around some sort of personal truth, you know, like, uh, Jay, Jay has, um, you know, come out really openly about his struggle with anxiety and Cheryl Strayed wrote Wild, which was all about her 
um, conquering her grief. And Sheila Hamilton wrote a book about her husband killing herself and or himself and, and then her having to put her family back together again. And so the people who are drawn to this record, um, it, even the celebrity people, feel like people who are in that same tribe as me of folks who are trying to reclaim their experience in the world and, and make something beautiful out of, um, you know, something terrible or, or at least try, you know, I don't know, if, I don't know if we're all succeeding, but I know that that's the goal is to try to take this really awful, ugly thing and make something, um, easier to look at and, and, and put a container around, uh, pain or grief. And for me, it's all about trying to find, um, moments where I found resilience in myself or, or in the love in my life. Um, and, and, you know, build something around that. Mm -hmm. Now, did you go into the, uh, before the album, did you go into it with, with this theme in mind and, and, and you wanted to, it to portray that way or did it, you know, form organically? No, No, yeah, no, I just, I had a mental health breakdown, man. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, I, I lost myself in my house for a month and I recorded my my screaming and my crying and some of it was songs and some of it was not. And at the end of it, I had 500 voice notes that Dino and I went through and put songs together. So the theme was there in that I was writing about what I was living at the time. Um, but I, no, I didn't say, you know, it would be great to like make a concept record about suicidal ideation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't, I definitely did not do that. Mm-hmm. Um, it just sort of, it sort of happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it all ties into like like what we were talking about before and music, you know, being uplifting and helping you through hard times. And, yeah. you know, we, we can't, you know, deny the fact that everyone has, I, I, you know, it, it's funny t- to me, I, 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 I equate it like this. When I was a kid, it seems like everything's all, you know, happy and, and you, you don't see these things. Then you get older and you're like, wow, you know, there a lot of the people that I know and people around me and everyone just they seem to have mental you know you you find a lot of people you think have mental problems and it's sure. it's we can't deny that there's not you know that all of us struggles with this you know at one point in time yeah well i mean your brain is part of your body you know as much as people would like us to not think that our brains are actually just another part of our bodies that we have to take care of and sometimes you know your arm feels good and sometimes it doesn't and your brain's no different than- yeah any other part of your body in that way. So the thing that's really strange to me is that stigma piece, right? Like why, if you, if you have the flu or if you break your arm, you don't think twice about going to the doctor for that shit. Yeah. But if you have um, depression or if you're feeling like anxious, like it's somehow a character flaw. Mm -hmm. It's, it's super strange to me. And I think there's something dehumanizing about it too, right? Like if you have a friend who has cancer you know, and you're introducing them to someone, you, you might say, this is my friend Karen, and she has cancer. Yeah. But if your friend Karen is experiencing schizophrenia, suddenly she's not Karen anymore. It's like, this is Karen. She is schizophrenic. It's it's so weird. Yeah. We dehumanize people just because of their mental health status. And so I'm really trying to, you know, start that conversation, at least continue a conversation in my own life. Just having been on the receiving end of so much stigma throughout the years, and I'd say even now, you know, this record um, is scary for some people. Not not everybody wants to have this conversation we're having right now, mm-hmm. um, and I hope that changes over time. You know, my my hope is that um, we make it normal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, like you said, it's just it's uncomfortable for people to admit, like, hey, I yeah. I have I have bipolar, I have you know mental issues. It's just it's not comfortable, you know, you just wish that more people were open and honest. And that's another thing too, that a lot of people are just not open and honest to begin with about certain things. And it's, right. it's, it's difficult because, you know, it, it, you find that when people release certain things like this, they, they're so much better off. And <laughs> it's, it's, it's totally. a shame that people don't, you know? Well, and in music, you know, my guiding principle a long time ago, a really wise person said to me, Logan, um, it doesn't have to be pretty to be true, mm-hmm. but if it's true, it's beautiful. Yeah. And I just think like, you know, if we were all doing that, just doing that, just being honest, um, shit would be so much better. Yeah. So much easier <laughs> too. <laughs> yeah, totally. It's exhausting to have to live life, much less pretend you're not living it while you live it. It's like such a weird 
Dang, I, I just can't even subscribe to any of that. I, I totally reject that, which is why I, you know, I occupy the space I occupy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, and and now it seems that you're doing the, you know, you're trying to get the message out there with the, uh, you know, that concert series, uh, keep Oregon, uh, Oregon well. Um, describe, yeah, describe that, and you know what what that means to you, and you know what sure. you're doing to, uh, with that. Yeah. So I partnered with. Um, uh, all of the different major media in town, so iHeartRadio and Z100, and um, you know Alpha Media, Kink FM, KGW, NBC, all these media outlets mm-hmm. in 2014 to launch um, Keep Oregon Well, which is a public advocacy campaign designed to fight stigma sur- uh, surrounding mental and behavioral health. Um, and we're fighting it through the arts. We're fighting that stigma through the arts, and so. I mean, it's kind of a coming out movement, right? It's about people standing up and saying, hey, I'm Logan Lynn. I am successful on one hand, and also I struggle with my mental health, mm-hmm. um, and it's normal. And so, you know, I have the Keep Oregon Well concert series. I've partnered with over 100 bands just over the last two years, everybody from Kevin Bacon to Of Monsters and Men to um, Flo Rida and Kanye West. And, you know, I've partnered with a bunch of people, um, and we have these shows at our studio and then um i interview the bands about their own mental and behavioral health and how they take care of themselves on the road and then their their fans sign up for um to keep oregon well pledged to fight stigma it's it's been really incredible i think to have this idea and watch it take off and, and have it be so embraced by people like violent femmes and folks that i grew up listening to that i have you know had some kind of idea about that they, you know, they're kind of my heroes or my idols and to have them be as cool as I had always hoped um, and join us and, and show their support and, and let, let, let us use their name and their audience to get this message out has mm-hmm. been, you know, wildly um, exciting. It feels, it feels like the, the, the best possible scenario. So we reach about a million, 50,000 people every week, mm-hmm, which is campaign. a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. So you know, my my inbox is full. Yeah, that's that's great to see. Now, in you know, over the course of the years, can you remember you know an instance from uh, you know either an email or a message from a fan uh, you know that really touched you? I I know I see this a lot. You know, we had a a band that we interviewed called Heffron Drive, and you know we had a lot of people asking questions. You know, I, I listen to your music, and it's really you know. It's really touched me in some way. It got me through uh, very hard times. Was there anything specific that you remember, like a, you know, some kind of story that was told that just really got to you? Yeah, I mean, I've had a lot of I've had a lot of that. You know, I I think by my being so open about my own addiction struggles for mm-hmm. so many years, I'm eight years clean now, but I was addicted to crack cocaine and alcohol for 16 years, very publicly before that, mm-hmm. and um, sang about it and talked about it and then talked about getting clean and. Um, I had so many people and still do reach out to me and thank me for saying that, um, you know, for, for telling my story, how I told it. I didn't pretend that it had been easy. I also didn't say, um, you know, you need, there's only one way you need to go to a meeting. Uh, I, I, I very openly talked about the medicine that I took to get off of cocaine, followed by the therapies that I did and the groups that I went to. And I had a lot of people try the same thing and succeed. Um, And so I think I was, you know, I built community around the recovery stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I also, uh, you know, was early, early on, one of the only out openly gay people in music, Mm -hmm. you know, on TV, certainly. Uh, And so that was, you know, I had a lot of LGBT youth Mm -hmm. reach out to me and, and, and thank me for being on in their living rooms with their parents watching TV and things like that. So, you know, those things are always cool. Um, the stuff around mental health, though, recently has been so meaningful to, and also kind of difficult. You know, I have uh, at all the public appearances I do or have done uh, in the last year or so, I have mothers come up to me who've lost their kids to suicide and, and talk to me about that experience. I also have parents come up to me who have children who are actively using uh, and are dying, frankly, of their addiction. Um, come up to me desperately asking for help and 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 how did it work for me and what do they do 
And so, you know, a lot of it is moving. All of it is moving. And, and I also feel a different kind of pressure mm -hmm. than I used to around what I say really matters. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so there's an, there's something on, it's an honor, right? Like I feel honored that I have that megaphone. Mm -hmm. And also I feel scared about the megaphone too. You know, I don't, I would never want to say to a parent, here's what worked for me have them go try that and have it not work and then have that be on me. Right. So yeah. it's like, there, it's very important that people understand that my story is my story and what worked for me might not work for everybody, but that it's worth exploring all the different options. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's an option. And now it's, uh, you use this as ammun uh, as ammunition to write more records. And, you know, with all those things that you've been told in the megaphone you have, do you, you know, and in hard times, you use that as, you know, kind of strength and power to go on and continue writing more music. For sure, man. And, on, you know, honestly, recovery is possible. That's the bottom line. It's like whatever you're struggling with, it doesn't it doesn't have to be forever. You know, I mean, nothing nothing's forever, even your struggle. And so I think that's the idea is that if I can just get people to um hang on a little longer and, and, you know, be with us a little longer than I think life does change. Life does get better. And I don't think that's just for me. I think that's for all of us. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it could just be a period in your life. It doesn't have to be your whole life. Absolutely. Absolutely. And part of what makes us who we are is that struggle, you know, like I'd be such a boring person with nothing to write about mm -hmm. if I hadn't suffered a little. And if I hadn't really had to fight for who I am and my place in the world, I, you know, it would, I would be a different person. And so often that stuff that feels like it's awful ends up being the thing that is, is great. Yeah. Like you, you said, it, you know, you wouldn't do the things you, you do if you were boring. And that's why it's a common theme, you know, between with, rock, you know, people that play music and musicians, you know, that's how that's why they write music. And that's how they get through it. You know, the common theme of this episode, <laughs> uh, that's how they get For through sure. it. And that's why they're musicians. If you're a boring person, you know, and, and you're a brain dead and you didn't have problems and struggles, you wouldn't be doing this. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Logan. So you have a, a show this Friday. It's at uh, now the Skype Live Studio, right? Yeah, Skype Live Studio, and it's actually it's being live streamed, so anybody can tune in 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time at skypelivestudio dot com. Mm -hmm. Now, is that your personal studio, or? Uh, no, it's uh, it's through our keyboard. It's the Keep Oregon Well uh, mm -hmm. campaign. It's where we have all of the concert series. This is one of the concert series. Oh, great. So, and that's actually it's in Portland, so it's uh, close to home because it's you know in, yeah, at your it's home. Yeah, in Portland. <laughs> yeah, totally. It's in Portland, but anybody anywhere can tune in at that skypelightstudio dot com. All right, great. So um, you know, I thank you for being on the podcast. Uh, before we go, any last plugs? You know, your Facebook, uh, certain anything coming up? Uh, you know, plug away. Sure. Yeah. Anybody can find me at um, loganlinmusic.com. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, everywhere. I'm pretty easy to find. Mm -hmm. All right, man. Thank you. Good luck. And, uh, you know, hope to talk to you soon. And if you're ever in New Jersey, uh, me and John will, will, you know, stop by, check you out. Sounds good, man. All right. Take care. Yeah, Thanks for having too. me on. No problem. Have a good night. All right. Bye.